a sister was telling me about one of the babalawos in our city that every married woman not every married every woman that works for him married or single he must sleep with you she has hard evidence it's not that we didn't know we knew but for me to have hard evidence once he's trying to sleep with you, he will start appearing in your dreams. You don't know divination. Sexual perversion. It's in the pulpit. Verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old, old living that you may be a what? Since you are truly, you truly are unliving. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was what? Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old living, nor with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unliving bread of what? Sincerity. Verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle, not to do what? I wanted you to see this. That's why I said, let's read it together. So if I know somebody is sexually immoral, Paul said that person should not be your friend. Should, don't keep company with sex. And you know in the New Testament, sexual immorality is not, does not begin only when you remove your trouser. Some people in their thoughts and in their heart, they are worse than prostitutes in brothels. Immoral. Some are looking for opportunity to act out their fantasies. They've not gotten opportunity. Verse 10. Yet, I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you will need to go out of... He's saying that these people, you need to meet with sexually immoral people. You need to meet with covetous people, idolaters in the world. Some of them will be your colleagues in the office. He's not saying you should not talk to your colleagues in the office. He's talking about a sexually immoral person where? In the church. This is Paul. This is the Bible, not me. When you come out and you say, somebody who is fornicating should not be in the pulpit. They say, who are you to judge? Paul said, drive him. Drive him. My father in the Lord came out and said, he has not touched any woman. Anyone that says he has touched her should come out and say it. They came to attack him. Paul says, don't keep company. Don't sit down near. If you know, if you come to church and you know this brother, he says, he said, don't sit near him. Those, those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't keep company. Scripture. That's not even the end. Go further. He says, but now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a rivaler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Not to even what? Don't eat with the person. This is Bible, not me, not the bad man. This is Bible, scripture. Don't even eat. You know this person is a Christian and he's sexually immoral. Don't eat with the person. Don't eat. But you see, many have bowed to the God of sex within the church. How do you, how can you become a victim of this God? Let me give you four things. How you can become a victim of the God of sexual immorality. Four things. I'm getting ready to close now. Four things. How to become a victim of the God of sexual immorality. Number one, live without boundaries. Live without boundaries. Live without boundaries. Married man be chatting with single sister and be calling her all kinds of names. In fact, early, early on in our marriage, my wife had to sternly, sternly caution me over a sister like that. My wife, sternly. 
So these kind of conversations with this girl are not correct. Stanley. That's me. My wife. Married woman, there are conversations you cannot have with a single brother. There, there are times that if even me, I want to, if there's a pressing matter at work, my usual says, call so and so person, and the person is married, a female. I will send her a text. What if her husband walks in and I'm talking to her at 11 p.m.? Who, you, who, who are you talking to? A married woman. What is, is he your brother? What kind of conversation? I will send her a text. It's because you don't have boundaries. That's why you can fall anyhow. All kinds of things. People sit on your lap. You are hugging us. Everybody in the office, you hug. Everybody in the office, you have even graduated now since hugging is not satisfying you. You are greeting everybody with a holy kiss. It doesn't mean there is a place and I don't need to go further. Where the pastor felt that the way to show love, hmm, he carries his daughters in the Lord. Hmm, when he comes to church. Oh, my darling daughter. <laughs> Yeburavake. <laughs> when the immorality broke out, it was like an armed man. <laughs> like an armed man. Armed man. The easiest way to become a victim of the God of sexual immorality is to live without what? Number two. Expose yourself to doctrine of devils. Expose yourself to what? Number one, hyper grace. Doctrines that are designed to kill your sensitivity to the things God calls abominations. Doctrines of devils. Oh! Fornication is a sin in the body. So when I fornicate, it's my body that is sinning. My spirit. That's a demon talking. A demon. A demon. Expose yourself to the doctrines of devils. Number three. Refuse godly counsel. You will naturally become a victim to the God of sexual immorality if you refuse what? Number four, have no accountability structure in your life. Have no accountability structure where? As a young man, make sure there is a man in your life you can be accountable to. A man you can tell, daddy or my brother, I'm beginning to have a reaction towards this sister. And the person can say, Oga, pull out now. I've taught you before, or maybe it's workers I was teaching. In your accountability structure, it is both vertical and it is what? Horizontal. So you must have somebody that is higher than you, that you can be accountable to, and then you must have accountability on the same level. You must. You must have brothers, your own guys, your own girls, your own friends in your life that you can go to and say, I'm beginning to behave anyhow, and the person will say, behave yourself. And you will listen. People that can pray for you, pray with you, and can caution you when you are beginning to drown, you must have. And then you must have somebody in your life that can tell you, don't do that thing, and you will not ask why. You say, yes, sir. You must. If you don't, <laughs> and you live recklessly and carelessly, you will not recognize yourself after a few years. He said their bodies were scattered where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness. I want to tell you a story before we pray tonight. I told you this weekend, I'm leaving the, the fire for Sunday. These the ones are for teaching. 
I read a story, very painful, of an evangelist. You know, I'm an evangelist, so I used to go and look for evangelists that have done great things before me and beg God that he would give me some of the things that was on their life. This guy, the biographer that wrote it said, it's because his story was not chronicled. That if his story was chronicled, he would have been in the class of Ayobabalola. Witches were afraid of his name. He entered into towns with the gospel. And as he preached the gospel, the power of God, the convicting power of God, deliverances happened at the snap of a finger. He was not just an evangelist. He was a prophet. In fact, many felt that his ministry was even greater than I of Abalala. The only problem was that he was in the villages of the southwest. You could not stand near him as a cripple and not walk. He didn't need to pray. So in the village where he was living, the council of witches now made him their target that they were going to finish him. So you know what they did? They ensured that a woman who was a witch her and her daughter moved close to his house. <laughs> the biographer said for years they kept attempting to get the man but they were unsuccessful. How many long? Yes, that's how patient Satan is. So when they had tried and tried, the mother now came up with a plan. And they began to build gradually. You know what she did? Because the man was always going for meetings, going for meetings, going for meetings. The minute he comes home from a crusade or from a, a, a village outreach, tired and drained, as he just sits in the parlor, the mother will run to his door and knock. Bo, 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 bo. My daughter is convulsing. My daughter, he will run to their house and if she was pretending, you know, the girl was pretending. He will run to her house, see the girl. Do, 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 do. He will pray. Instantly, she will say she's healed. Then he will go back. It was always every time he came home drained and tired. They did it for months. Did it for months. One day, the mother didn't come herself. The mother arranged her daughter, who was also a witch, to just tie wrapper on her chest and go and knock on his door. This time, they targeted it in such a way, he just came back. He had taken off his clothes. He was wearing a towel. Was just about to enter the bath. The girl knocked on the door and collapsed and started shaking. So him as a man of God just decided to bend and pray for her. She grabbed him. The biographer says because he was already drained and tired. He had no strength to fight back. He slept with a young lady. Weeks after he became sick, he died. That's how patient, that's how deliberate Satan is. Some people won't die. Oh. Satan will succeed in getting them to bow to sexual immorality. Their first attempt, HIV. First attempt. They have to abort a baby. And all Satan has been looking for is for you to spill blood so that he can put a curse on your bloodline. Satan is that patient. I want you to beg God tonight. Help me, Lord. You see, this week we have been begging God for help. <laughs> Help me, Lord, that I will not bow to strange gods. Beg him. I may never to betray you, Lord. 
me at my full. Oh Jesus, I am your sacrifice. Take me and pour me out. Help me never to betray you, Lord. Always keep me at my pole. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I am your sacrifice. Take me and pour me 